I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. to Conversations with Al McFarland. I think about art all the time. I think about the creative spirit. I think about the genius of our community. And I enjoy every time I have uh, uh, the opportunity to spend some time with artists, creators, uh, people that live, eat, sleep, breathe, uh, making art. So I'm pleased to have a program today with three of such uh, in this community. My friend, uh, Takumba Aiken, and I have gone back uh, maybe 40, 50 years almost uh, in uh, Minneapolis uh, talking about art, uh, having a conversation we started that we have not finished That's and right. probably will never finish. Uh, my friend Charles Caldwell owns the Caldwell Gallery in North Minneapolis, a, a huge and super uh, muralist uh, and great painter. And my friend Nick Muhammad, who is a music producer. He owns Titan Records. So today's conversation is about uh, art. And for me, art is about beauty, uh, virtuosity. And I want to engage you brothers on the question of what virtuosity, what beauty means to you, how this idea of beauty uh, creeps into your mind and through your fingertips or through your voice or through your plan. Hmm. And so what are you bringing to the world as an artist? What's your gift and what is your mission? Takumba, if I ask you first, what's, what's your mission? Why are you here? Uh, my mission is my grandmother's mission, my grandparents' mission, my ancestors' mission. Uh, but when you said beauty, that's why I said that because I thought about my grandmother. You know, mm -hmm. uh, of course, you know, I thought both my parents were uh, quite something, but it was what's out of the heart, you know, and what was always shared, not mine, 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 but ours. You know, I, I, I got confused when we were somewhere in Chicago and there's all these people, all kinds of people. And my mother said, there's your relatives, so you, you know, they're watching you. So you need to watch them, they take care. Mm -hmm. And so in doing that, I had to kind of um, observe things in a different way. You know, I remember my mother telling me that, or it was an aunt or something, and then she said, oh, we had art, you know. Now, my grandmother was a washerwoman, right? So they lived in a cabin in South Carolina, and they would get from the, the rich person's house the magazines, and the magazines had pictures of ads with flowers and stuff like that in it, and would take those and plug up the holes in the cabin. And I realized I do collages, so it's like something carries on. And then when I looked at some of those old magazines, do you know those things are printed better than the jaclets they do now because they were layered lithography? So they have good taste. You know, so whether it's a visual thing, aesthetic of theirs, or what's coming out of their heart, it sort of balanced the whole thing out, you know. And I, I you know, when I, when, I, when I think of continuing that, you know, I just try to be a good person, you know, try to, uh, I've raised my kids and they are good people. And what comes out of that is something beautiful, you know, no matter how ugly I might look in the aesthetic kind of thing, but the beauty takes away all of that, peels that off, you know. And the constant giving of it is like chipping off a stone until people see all that, you know, that, that's, that's, I like that, you know. And so my paintings are the same thing, you know, and my paintings are constant. I'll paint on a rock or I'll paint on canvas. Just keep working. Whatever, just, whatever, keep, whatever. just keep working, you know. <laughs> so when I, when, I, when I raise the question, uh, mission, um, yeah. so what makes you do what you do? Uh, okay, when I had to do, uh, when I used to write these, used to write these for these grants and stuff like that, the big money grants and all of that stuff, and I used to write for one, the Bush Fellowship. <coughs> and my friend Say too and I, you know, kind of came up together as, a, you know, the sort of dynamic duo, you know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, uh, at the, of the time, you know, and it's constantly, you know, Nick's got his, you know, Charles has got his, you have yours, mm -hmm. we all were, you know, and so there's somebody you can play back and forth from. Well, in writing this grant, they asked you to describe your work. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is absurd, I'm not going to do this, because, you know, my work describes itself. 
And then say to said, well, you know, but, but what is that? What is that? And I'm like, look, man, I'm not going to do this because I create my work to heal the hearts and souls of people by evoking a positive spirit. Uh, 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 there, give there me a pill. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first time I got the Bush Fellowship. There you go. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, and I have to say, you know, I, you know, given, given honor to God, you know, the creator, and that kind of thing is what makes me. I really don't do anything. I just get lucky and be able to sign my name onto the canvas. Mm -hmm. But the things I see coming out of that canvas or the things I see coming off of a wall or a mural or a grain elevator, I don't even know how I got them. So as it's being created, you're looking at it and you're discovering it? It's just I'm the, it's a conversation. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a it's a dance, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, but I'm I'm I, you know, I'm like more of an improvisational musician. And then the way that I work, um, somebody described me as the Duke Ellington of visual art. Hmm. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but then she, she explained, this was a high school girl, first year freshman out in, uh, I think it's Park Center. Um, and she said, no, 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 like, you know how to play music? I'm like, yes. She said, but you know how to write the music? I'm like, well, she says, you teach us how to use the materials here. And then you let each one, she said, you told us we were all musicians and that we were, you know, you were looking for our expertise. Mm -hmm. And she said, then we brought it together and we did this mosaic. And I'm like, yeah, well, so what? She said, but I heard that you've never done a mosaic before. I said, well, don't tell nobody. <laughs> you know, because I'm learning at the same time you're learning. Mm -hmm. And we share those skills. So I don't care if you're 10, 5, everybody has a value and has a skill. So my whole thing is to try to bring that out, evoke it, let, let, let them discover each other and discover me all at the same time. I'm no big deal by myself, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm a grain of sand, mm -hmm. and that makes part of that beach. Mm -hmm. I don't know, you take me out, maybe there's no beach, mm -hmm. you know, because it could be habitual to take everything out. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to be inclusive this way, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's sort of like, it's part, it's, doing art is like, and the people I work with is like a family. Mm -hmm. Not everybody in your family do you like, but somehow it works. You have to have that positive, negative, yin and yang, you know. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's how I kind of, I look at my work pretty natural, down earth. I'm like, you know, I tell people I'm just a country boy, you well, know. So when I started seeing your work uh, back in 1970, Tacumba, uh, I viewed you as a guy that was, uh, <clears throat> A person that is uh, a spirit man. Uh, that's how I would have said, uh, uh, describe you to people. This is a guy who's living in the cosmos. Uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, who's living true. in that's the cosmos, true. right? Yeah. Who's <laughs> visiting uh, the earth, right? And oh, his man. presence here is temporary uh, because he's really doing something else somewhere else, and this is a glimmer of it. So that's how you look to me. Well, you, so you're going to tell my secret to everybody. Now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it seems to me the theme uh, and uh, the images mm -hmm. uh, reflected your ability to capture uh, wave upon wave upon wave, layer upon layer upon layer yeah, yeah. Of, uh, of personalities and, and spirit, spirits yeah. and uh, structures. And, and running into people on the way, like John mm -hmm. Biggers. Mm -hmm. And John Biggers, when he did the Celebration of Life mural and stuff like that, I had run into him in, that might have been the same year I was asked to do that. And I was really busy, so I was a little arrogant. I'm like, I don't have time, I don't have time. And Pat Patricia Phillips comes and says, Takuma, I have this project. And I'm like, oh, Lord, how am I going to say no? And she said, I'm going to do this mural, da 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 And John Biggers, I said, I'll clean my slate when we start. And she had asked say two the same thing. Mm -hmm. But she didn't know that a year before, I had taken say two to Brazil for a conference. <laughs> a black arts conference, and we ran into John Biggers by the pool in the Othon Hotel in, in Rio. In Rio, wow. And I'm looking, and I'm like a blubbering idiot, right? Give people some background. Who is John Biggers? John Biggers he, is... Uh, 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 and, and talk about the mural as well. That was a, a, an awesome uh, yeah. both contribution and loss. John Biggers was uh, an uh, 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 African-American artist um, uh, out of Texas... Uh, um, who well, originally from North Carolina, but uh, created imagery that represented African American, uh, Africans and African Americans, uh, kind of firstly as African Americans, did some stuff while he was in the war, 
did things that showed about people, showed about people that were rags, selling rags and stuff like that, showed about the elegance and the, uh, uh, the regalness of the Africans when he went to um, uh, Ghana and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and brought, I mean, but he did the patterns and the lines, he learned about everything, you know, he learned about the sacred geometry and all of that came out of his work and all of a sudden you start looking at his work and it looked like it was talking about something out of space. Mm -hmm. And, and here was Sun Ra talking about space is the mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. All of this. So John Biggers was a quintessential. He was one of the greatest artists mm -hmm. in the world who happens to be African American. Mm -hmm. And the stories he told were clearly African American based, who happens to tell about the, what everybody goes through mm -hmm. within that work. And he would do layers and layers. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was uh, and, uh, did murals in, in, in uh, Houston and all over the country and all, a little bit all around the world. And we were the first, say too, and the group um, that did Celebration of Life was the first collaborative mural that he had ever done with such a large group of people. And when he saw us, he said, oh yes, you know, you know, because we took emerging artists, we took, mm -hmm. we had everybody, everybody was just buying into this thing. It was on uh, Lindale and Olson Highway. It was a 200 foot wall. Yeah, huge. Huge. Curved wall. Curved wall. Around the corner. It was a, it was a sound barrier. Mm -hmm. A berm, yeah. Right. Yeah, and, berm, yeah. And, 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 and to some people it was, it was blocking mm -hmm. the north side, so we decided to make it a gateway. Mm -hmm. And it's celebrated. Mm -hmm. And when they tore that down, they thought that just a small group of black people would be, you know, upset. Mm -hmm. And all of Minnesota, all of the world, and a lot of them that came, got down on my case, I'm like, I, you know, I'm only one people and we're only a group of people. They didn't realize how many people paid attention to that. Mm -hmm. So John Biggers was a person that says when you do something for a community, you engage the community. But once you get done, you take your hands off of it. Yeah, you let it go. Yeah. You know, you can you can nurture a crop for so long, but then you know you have to you know send it to the market. You can have some other people pick it, some other people do whatever th with it. You know, so his his imagery was just endless, endless amounts of information. So I had asked John, why did he accept Say Two and I? You know, because you know they're presenting artists to him, and he said, you know, Say Two is like you know three dimensional space thinker, you know, da 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 da, the symbology and all that. And I'm like, oh, that didn't leave too much for me. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> so I was waiting and he said, and you, you're the master of layers. <laughs> now that just came from the master of layers, mm -hmm. as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. So I was nervous, because mm -hmm. now I have to live up to something that, mm -hmm. hopefully I do, I had a dream I would live to 140. I hope I make it there so I can at least get a piece of that mastery. I'll see you there. I, I, I know. Just, I have the same dream. <laughs> I'm going to be the one for you, so that's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. I, yeah. I, you know, all my dreams come true. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't have too many <laughs> dreams about having millions, <laughs> but all my dreams come true. And that, you know, that one, that one kind of bothered me, but now that I know you had yeah, it, I, know I got good company. Absolutely. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations <laughs> with Al McFarland. My friend, Takumba Aiken, and I go back, so we've only uh, done the first 40 of our 150 year relationship. Here. Right, right. And that's a, a good thing to know that we both plan to be around a long time. You did a painting uh, that uh, one of the ones, you know, I have a, a, the Tacumba room at my office at the Marcus <laughs> Garvey House. Yeah, I hear uh, about in it. In North <laughs> Minneapolis. You heard about it, so you got to come by and see it. Uh, and eventually we'll have the Caldwell room as well. Yeah. We're working on that. We're off to a good start. Yeah, <laughs> off to a great start. But one of the paintings in my house is one that you did uh, that. Uh, features my daughter, and I described uh, oh, right, it yeah. to her this way. I said, here's a picture of you uh, in the future meeting your companion. And um, um, and so from the age of five or six when you did the painting, yeah, she she's been growing, looking uh, for the fulfillment of the prophecy uh, that the picture represents. So your pictures, your paintings, your drawings are so rich and so real. And they're personal for everybody that they touch. I think so. Thank you for what you oh, do. Oh well, thank you. You know, yeah. you, you've been a, a, a strong supporter. You know, we've gone through. I, I did done illustrations for you know the the different publications right. that you've done, yeah. and, and that it was gratifying because I didn't know I could do that until then. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I used to do pointillism. You know, and I I still couldn't be still, so I do the face, and then I have things coming out of the hair, mm -hmm. you know, or in the hair that you see with the, what the person was thinking. But I wouldn't have thought of that if it wasn't a collaboration, you know. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll be back in a minute with uh, uh, shifting the conversation to artist Charles Caldwell. Uh, stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you.
I'm Al McFarland. Welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. Uh, a delightful conversation with friends of mine who are creators, who are artists. And I want to turn now to Brother Charles Caldwell. He owns a studio in North Minneapolis and uh, is the proud proprietor and creator of a huge mural that invites people to our community in North Minneapolis uh, on West Broadway. Charles, welcome. Thank you. So right. let me uh, say that You've uh, been a, uh, a pioneer and a fighter. Uh, I view you as um, uh, almost pugilistic uh, in bringing your art and your message and the fervor that you bring to your crea creativity to the community. Uh, what is driving you? If somebody had to describe Charles Caldwell, what would you say uh, speaking about yourself? Whoa, that's a tall request. <laughs> But I, um, what drives me is, is the community, is the people that I'm around, the people that I see every day, mm -hmm. people that I think about daily. Uh, a lot of my work is realism, photorealism. Mm -hmm. So it consists, so I'm inspired by family, friends, community. I uh, try to capture the essence of our community. I always say to people, 100 years from now, when we're all gone, the work that I create today is what represents us. So it's kind of a, a truth to be told. So I, I, I take on the responsibility of making sure that uh, the story is told correctly through the imagery that I create. I um, try to capture the positive essence of our community, the positive things. We hear so much about the negative things that come out of the black community. And so I'm not inspired by any of those things. Uh, so the things that I create are positive things that's uplifting. And when someone looks at one of my painting, I, paintings, I want them to walk away with a feeling that makes them think about themselves and the role that they play and making sure that they're part of that uplifting spirit that it takes to encourage and, and build a, a positive environment. And surround it. Describe the welcome to, to West Broadway, to North Minneapolis Mural. The welcome to North Minneapolis Mural is uh, located on the corner of uh, Broadway and 4th Street, which is uh, 94 and Broadway. It's a uh, 35 by 60 foot mural, uh, hand painted one brush stroke at a time. It's done in, with a uh, latex uh, paint. And uh, just, it was a very great opportunity for me to be called upon to, to, to take on that project. Uh, it's the biggest piece that I've ever done. And the thing about being an artist, most of the paintings that I've done are in private. Mm -hmm. You know, artists myself work a lot in the AM when everybody's sleeping and it's the quiet time to just completely open up and just receive that spiritual guidance that guides me through uh, my creative process. And so that project, when I, when I got the yes, the okay that I was gonna be selected to do that piece, I uh, would walk, go up to that location and look at that wall and wonder uh, how I was gonna be able to complete that project and knowing that I was gonna be completely opened to the public mm -hmm. to watch every step of the way on doing that. So I did a lot of praying and a lot of uh, uh, understanding that the artist that I had became, become was going to be expressed on that big wall, that big challenge. The scene is a band, the a scene, jazz band. Yes. Describe that. It's a music piece. It's uh, called Can You Hear Me Now? Mm -hmm. It's the inspiration of the piece. And so all the subject matters that's on that piece are in motion. Uh, the songstress that's on there, it's an image of uh, Billy, inspired by Billy Holiday, the late Billy Holiday and she's in a vocal uh, position, so you can tell that there's music, vocals coming out of her mouth. Mm -hmm. um, the piano player, it's just the hands and the piano keys, are, are, you can see a few of the keys compressed. Uh, there's a bass player on there, there's a, a, a drummer, a drum set there. And so um, the piece is called Can You Hear Me Now? So when you look at that piece and you think about the title of it, it gives you a moment to stop and reflect and just listen. And you'll start to hear the sound 
of that piece because you know that there's vocals coming out of that mouth and mm -hmm. you know what that sounds mm -hmm. like. You hear the piano keys, you know what that sound like. So it gives your eyes an opportunity to guide your ears to a listening sound that's there painted on a mural. That's the great thing about art is it's a, it's a visual statement. When they say a picture is worth a thousand words, you can choose the words. Mm -hmm. And so when you're standing before a great work of art, you can choose your own interpretation of mm -hmm. it and you can choose words and things that you're familiar with to make you familiar with that sound. So I chose that subject matter because music is universal. Mm -hmm. So um, when you are doing public art, it needs to be uh, presented and expressed in a way that the whole community and the whole public that enjoys it can have some participation in it and have it mean something to them in some kind of way. And so when I was painting that piece, uh, I would be up on the scaffold and I mean, I would be anywhere from two hours to 10, 12 hours a day on it and thousands of cars coming by, people blowing their horns, a lot of thumbs up. I never really took my eyes off. I just throw my hand up if I hear a horn and try to acknowledge Mm -hmm. all of the acknowledgement that was being given, because that's all encouragement mm -hmm. and all encouraging. So it was, a, 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 that piece was just such a warm and welcoming and inviting piece. Mm -hmm. And the subject matter was welcoming and inviting. It's uh, got some clouds and it like looks like a nice summer day. And mm -hmm. of course, being in Minnesota, mm -hmm. I was excited about how that piece was gonna look and make people feel in the winter time. Yeah. Well, I tell you this, uh, anytime you see it, you feel like you are being invited to North Minneapolis. What I love most about it is that these are black artists, African American artists, and um, the idiom is obviously jazz or blues. Yeah. It's kind of a, the feeling of one of our places, like a Tonk House or something like that. Exactly. Could be a concert. But the feeling is that uh, uh, the, the Can You Hear Me Now is making a statement of ownership of North Minneapolis to our community. Mm -hmm. yes. I get a feeling like this is a signal. It's a signpost that says, this is whose house I'm walking into. So you've created the signpost and the description and the definition of our neighborhood so we can say this is ours. And the ours is ours, but everybody else, but we, you know, yeah. uh, are the source, the center, uh, and the foundation of that community. And I think your piece speaks to that and sort of heralds that uh, in, in many, many ways. I don't know what you think. Yeah, it, it really speaks uh, to our community and, 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 and I've, it's definitely a piece that's about our community mm -hmm. and inspired from our community. I moved to Minneapolis uh, in 1970, mm -hmm. destination North Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. So I've grown in the North Minneapolis. I was um, a kid in North Minneapolis and I would do a lot of creative things throughout the summers, throughout the years. I went to uh, the Minneapolis Technical Institute for Commercial Arts. And that year, after I graduated from high school, I would walk the streets to the bus stop with my portfolio. And I did that all summer long, and, and people would see me, uh, my peers would see me, and they'd go, man, what are you doing with that big bag? What are you doing? What are you up to? And uh, it was just inspiring and encouraging every day that I got up in the mornings and took that walk about six blocks to the city bus stop and take the bus downtown and come back in the afternoon. And, and, and that constant um, consistency that people were seeing is on a daily basis, it was like watching me grow and watching me develop. And so the same community that watched me grow as a kid watched me paint that mural. Mm -hmm. And so that was an awesome connection between uh, the community. And when you saw it, it's a piece that is totally embraced by North Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I'm an artist that grew up and born and raised in, or raised in North Minneapolis mm -hmm. really just uh, make that piece so welcoming and makes a lot of people feel like that's, it, it belongs to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as an artist, uh, when I create a piece, Usually when I create a small painting on a smaller scale, I can, when I'm done, I can stand on this side of it and enjoy it as you do. Mm -hmm. And so that mural on Broadway in 94, when I drive up or drive in that direction, you it's enjoy like, it. I totally enjoy it. I and enjoy I, it. I mean, I enjoy it to the point where it's not, I'm not, I don't embrace 
myself as being the person that created it, mm -hmm. but I embrace myself as the person that something so great came through mm -hmm. and it means so much to me and so many other people. That's amazing. That's a part of my, the community. And, and so when did you recognize that you have a gift? How do you describe your, your artistry, your, your talent? I call it a gift. Do, do you call it a gift? I definitely call it a gift. So how, how, how did you know it? How did you come to realize it and understand it as a gift? When and how? I was, uh, I've been an artist since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, always, I was born to be an artist mm -hmm. and blessed with recognizing it. Okay. But the most profound moment came with me uh, was basically through the Minneapolis public school system. Um, all my art teachers recognized it as an, uh, at an early age. And I realized that it was something special because I, I would always be given the opportunity to work in a space in the room of my own. Mm -hmm. When I walked into a classroom, the art teachers that knew I was coming to their class always say, hi, Charles, you can work over there and we'll teach class over here. <laughs> because they acknowledged the fact that I had some special talents going on. So it was, it was nurtured and encouraged at an early age. I had great relationships with all of my art teachers, males, females, of all different diversities. Um, art is just such a universal thing that it's, it's, it's just an open, um, I know we're having a lot of issues going on in our uh, race relations right now, but you know, my experience with art has just been so open and mm -hmm. unconditionalized that um, just totally acceptable, accepted in a broader scale of, of people and community. Uh, in high school, I had two art teachers. One's name was Cheryl Creasy. Um, actually three, Cheryl Creasy, Sandy White, and then I had a social studies teacher named Miss Louise Hobson. I was the guy, as most artists are, doing a lot of dueling in, a, in the classroom. So I was a senior at this time, and Miss Hobson kept me after class. What school were you? West High, the late West High School mm -hmm. in South Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And she kept me after class, and she said, Charles, um, you haven't been getting your work done in my classroom, and this is your senior year, and there's a uh, report uh, that you're going to have to have turned in to uh, get your final grade, and I don't think you're going to get it done. So what I'm going to do is give you the opportunity to create a work of art, because I see that that's what you love, and you're not going to be a social studies teacher when you leave high school. Mm -hmm. I can see that art is going to be a your career, your destination. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna give you the opportunity to create this work of art and if it's something that I can appreciate, I'm gonna make sure that that's gonna get you your passing grade and help mm -hmm. you uh, move on to in the direction that you're gonna go in. Mm -hmm. And that was something that was so pro profound and powerful for me because I was getting ready to graduate from high school, really didn't know what I was gonna do. Mm -hmm. And uh, this teacher told me that this will get you what you need to get accomplished. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so I was, during that time, that was the year that Roots came out mm -hmm. with Alex Haley. Mm -hmm. And I uh, chose the subject matter of uh, LeVar Burton, who was the character of Kunta Kinte. Mm -hmm. And I did a painting of that with Kunta Kinte with the uh, chains on his wrist and LeVar Burton in a profile and brought that into her classroom, and she said, wow. <laughs> she said, I am totally impressed and I'm glad that I was able to see mm -hmm. you for who you are. Mm -hmm. And uh, that right there just kind of told me that I was on my way. Mm -hmm. And I uh, left there, and I had two stops to make when I finished high school. I was going to go to the art school downtown at uh, Minneapolis Community College or the military. So I made those two stops. I stopped at the military office first on uh, Lake Street. Mm -hmm. They told me I needed to bring my social security card. I had an, a one ID and you need two IDs. So I said, man, I'm not coming back here. I had two stops to make and this was my first stop. <laughs> and so I got up, I left, I had a uh, eight by 10 portfolio with me with some art images in it. And I stopped at the community college downtown, met two social uh, counselors there, pulled out my portfolio and they said, wow, mm -hmm. you're going to be starting school tomorrow. I said, tomorrow? They go, yeah. I go, huh? And I wasn't expecting <laughs> that to happen so fast. But the opportunity was there for me because there was a, another student that didn't show up for that last oh. spot. Mm -hmm. Guy was coming from Ohio. 
and they were so excited, I said, well, okay, I'll start tomorrow. It was awesome it was and felt time. good for me to have someone tell me what direction I was needed to go in. It was just encouraging that next step from Miss Louise Hobson. So how much, how much does the spirit uh, affect what you do, both your life and what you see and what you present in art? The spirit affects, uh, it, it totally controls everything that I think and do when it comes to art because I know that when I create a work of art, it's going to be what, it's a blueprint. And when I put my name on it, it says that this blueprint was created by Charles Caldwell. And so when someone looks at that piece and they say, well, who is this Charles Caldwell? And what is this person about? So every piece of work that I create is a reflection of who I am and what I'm about and the statement that I want to make to anybody that's looking at it. So I, I try to um, make sure that it's positive, make sure that it's honest, make sure that it's meaningful, it's true, and it's encouraging to someone else that's looking at it. You can say things to people with a picture mm -hmm. that you can't say with words. Your characters, to me, as we're talking, I'm trying to remember some things of uh, many of the items of yours that I've looked at and the impressions they've made on me. <clears throat> What's coming to my mind right now is uh, images of, uh, of people and children that are full. Uh, not skinny people, but healthy people. Yeah. Robust people. And there's uh, uh, both a sense of brilliance and a sense of um, vitality, that's the word. So I see you infusing a vitality or reflecting or demonstrating or capturing the vitality in our culture, in the faces and the bodies and the interactions of the people that you create. Is that a fair uh, uh, judgment? Uh, yes, it is. I, I try to um, capture the happiness, mm -hmm. the healthiness, mm -hmm. the positive positivity. Uh, so again, when I say, you know, what you just described and what you see in my work is the uh, description that I try to convey in it. Because I want people to, I, I, I want you to feel good about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're, you can have the roughest day, toughest time and walk and see one of my paintings and, and get something that's going to give you some strength. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uplift you, lift your head up, or put a thought in your mind. I did a piece called Sisters. I was out at the uh, Riverview Supper Club doing, displaying my work mm -hmm. there, and this lady came up, and she looked at that painting. It's a picture of two little girls sitting in a chair. One's about five, and the other one's about seven. And they're embraced, the big sisters hugging the little sister, mm -hmm. and you can just see the love mm -hmm. uh, depicted in that piece. And this lady looked at that piece for a while. She stood around for a while while I talked to other uh, visitors. And, she, and I looked at her as we got a moment to get a little closer, and she was crying. And I said, wow. <laughs> and uh, she said, I bet you just think I'm just a crazy lady over here crying over this painting. I said, no, I think this painting is saying something to you, and I hope that you'll share that with me. She said, well, my sister and I have been separated for many, many years, we haven't spoken in, the, in our adult lives for many, many years. And this picture right here just brings back the love that we left behind mm -hmm. to get us to mm -hmm. where we're disconnected now. And I want, she, so she bought two of those paintings because mm -hmm. she said, this one is for me and then I want to give one to my sister. Mm -hmm. And uh, I seen her many years later and she said, Charles, I, she said, you remember me? And I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, I still have my painting, and my sister still has her painting, and we have had a beautiful relationship together mm, since that, we connected with this painting. And so those experiences, I love exhibiting. Mm -hmm. I love being in t contact face-to-face -face with the public. I love explaining my work. I love hearing the explanations that people that are viewing my work give. Um, just another great experience with my work at the same area, at the Riverview Supper Club, there was a summer festival. This little boy and his father was there, have a painting called Inspiration. It's got a, uh, a male figure flexing, you know, got the muscles up, and there's a little kid standing in front of the bigger guy with the same pose. Mm -hmm. And 
this gentleman came up and he was looking at that painting and the little boy came up and he said, wow, look at me, daddy, look at that, that's me and you. We strong, ain't we, dad? And this man started crying. And I said, wow, and he said, man, he said, you know why I'm so emotional? He said, because my son, my wife and I are separated, mm -hmm. so I'm just getting to spend some time with my son here and he's getting ready to move out of state. Mm -hmm. And this picture and this moment right here just made it clear to us that we'll always be together wow. because of what he's experiencing in this piece of work that he sees is that we're strong. And so our, today, when I create a piece, I capture the essence of a moment captured in time that can be shared anywhere, any place, with anybody. And kids, adults, seniors, you know, our elders, it's just, I feel great and careful about the works that I create because I feel like I've been entrusted with the responsibility to convey a positive message and say the positive things and encouraging things that when we're all gone, today's will be reflected in our works of tomorrow. I'm Al McFarland. We'll come back and talk more. We'll bring another voice, uh, the voice of uh, a, uh, an artist who uh, does uh, sound, does voice, does uh, music, Nick Muhammad. Stay tuned. <laughs> I'm Al McFarland. Welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. This has been what I call a robust conversation. It's what we promised, and I think we've delivered it so far, and we'll continue. I want to bring into the conversation uh, the youngest person at the table, and that's uh, Nick Muhammad. Uh, young in age, but I think um, he matches all of us in uh, both experience and wisdom, certainly in intensity and certainly in integrity. Nick, uh, you've been uh, a force. Uh, I call you a representative and an icon for the hip-hop generation. I think you embody uh, the most positive aspects, the uh, core reality of the sense of self-reliance, the sense of we have the right and responsibility and the capacity, the capability of doing for ourselves. And I think you embody and your music embodies and your generation embodies a belief that uh, the world we want is the world that we can make and it won't be there until we decide to make it. Nobody's gonna give it to us, and if they did, we wouldn't take it because we right. trust ourselves, and in, our, and in ourselves we trust. Right. And as I'm saying that, that's the same as saying in God we trust because we're seeing the gods in ourselves. Mm. Your music says that. I think your art says that. Your art, you know, I talked to a few, uh, folks the other day about how one of the things that we need to do is figure out how to be conscious and conscientious in recognizing and addressing uh, the nature of God in each of ourselves, right? Mm. And if I expect you to be godly and address you that way and you expect the same of me, I think we change the game. We elevate and we become our true selves. So Nick, <laughs> how you doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm doing okay. Uh, uh, wow, that's 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 a heavy, deep question and statement. Very profound, brother. I appreciate it. Um, I'm good. You know, for me, music in particular, hip hop in particular, is made up of five essential elements. You know, emceeing, breaking, um, graffiti, art. Um, and you know, some say beatboxing, and then you have the knowledge of the in, the entire culture. And for me, like when, as I'm sitting here with two big giants of of the visual arts, and I listen to how they describe the inspiration for the work and the connections that they tap into, it's it's amazing that they don't see themselves as the the origin of it, but more the vessel that it comes through. And to me, that's like the beauty of, of art in and of itself, you know, and, that, and we, that carries over, I think, in most genres of art, artistic expression, that you can, that, that, that essence can be found, right? And it's, it's interesting that you make the connection of, you know, 
God within oneself and being godly and tapping into that divinity and expressing it through the art and allowing it to come through you. I think that's, to me, what attracts a lot of people to making a career of the arts. Because mm -hmm. really, you're, you're also a fan of humanity, right, on some level. And the arts gives you an, uh, a, a way to connect with humanity and to interpret, you know, what's going on, how you feel about it, and what your perspective is, right? And you share that, right? And to me, that's what what hip hop or music does for me on a very, you know, intimate level. When I first heard uh, Tupac as a young man and KRS One and Slick Rick, oddly enough. What struck me was their interpretation of young black life at the time mm -hmm. and the perspectives that they put on the table and the subject matters that they put on the table. I was in a household, unfortunately, that was you know split. You know, I was born in Mississippi. So as a young man hearing other black men, and for me, those were the, the first examples of strength and like, you know, having your own and, and being a man. Mm -hmm. And the messages I heard resonated with me on such a deep level. I would literally sit up at night. My mom made sure I had headphones because she did not want to hear everything mm -hmm. coming out of my room all hours of the night mm -hmm. while she was trying to sleep. So I literally would sleep with these albums mm -hmm. playing in my headphones, mm -hmm. right? Wake up in the morning, same thing. Wait till my mom hit the door, then the stereo cranked all the way Whole back house up. Shakes Whole house Whole house was shaking. Yeah. But it, 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 it awakened something in me. Like, it made me feel, you know, valid. Like, I had, you know, I could stand up a little straighter. When I walked to school, there was a whole group of people that shared that same experience on the way there, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we connected, and, and somewhere along the line, I, I, I was inspired to attempt it, right? <laughs> Get, take my pen and start my own rhyme notebook and, and sit at the lunchroom table and, and battle rap with me and my friends and really enjoy the culture. And, you know, I work in activism a lot, you know, around the Twin Cities, especially around the connection of hip hop and civic engagement. But in the arts portion, I found more equity and justice and fairness and true like acceptance of all cultures inside of those spaces. Mm -hmm. Now outside that's a whole different story, but in those spaces I became, you know, familiar with different people from different walks of life mm -hmm. that were all there in the name of this particular art form. Mm -hmm. Right? And so for me that godly connection, there was a a um uh can't remember the name of the scientist. He was talking about a uh, philosophy called string theory. And when he broke it down, he was saying that everything in these little quarks, which were smaller parts of atoms or, or something to that effect, all resonated at a certain vibration. Mm -hmm. And this was the rule through the entire universe. Mm -hmm. And I was like, huh, all music is is vibrations. So if art is the vision of God, the music is the language of God, right? And that's the way I took it, like, it's, it's, it's power, right? And that was one thing that I didn't have to negotiate with. There was clear rules in, in the realm of, of music in particular, but for me it was hip hop. And you couldn't partake in the culture back when I was coming up and not really put thought and effort into being original and having some, something authentic to say. Um, and before the commodification of the art form by corporations, there was such an organic uh, feeling and like uh, texture to it that you just can't duplicate. And for me, the reason I'm so passionate about it is like there's people all over the world that we're not even told about that follow the culture that black people set out in this country not just the youth, I mean black culture, period. Mm -hmm. I almost cried when I seen there's a film that Nas put out where he went into five different countries that were all practicing aspects of hip hop. And for them, they followed our every word. Every word. And we don't know it. And we don't know it. That's the problem. Right? Mm -hmm. And it was like, wow, there's kids literally break dancing in the mountains. Mm -hmm. For, for 
piece for self-worth. They tell their stories through their music. They grab the mic and they, they stand up extra tall. This is how they pass their legacy on. And I'm like, wow, we created that. Mm -hmm. We're a part of that, right? And that's why my bias about how it's used and promoted in this country is unapologetically fiery if you're, to me, commodifying it in a way that's about profit for people who don't care about the culture. Because now that we know that this audience is there, right, I'm more uh, upset at the fact that there aren't more entrepreneurs pursuing an independent paradigm to tell our own story as, you know, to borrow from uh, Sister Kenya earlier, and pioneer that and support that, right? And that, to me, is what the beauty of this, this culture and, and our capacity to put it out there can do. It really, literally connects people all around the world. So, so all of us at this table are business uh, people. We're all businessmen, right? And so uh, what I hear you talking about is the need for us to step up and to figure out how we can retain ownership of our genius, of our output, of our creativity, and, that, and, and also how we can profit from uh, how we can share and benefit from, benefit can be called profit, but it's income, and how we can use our creativity, our thoughts, our minds, our ideas to feed our families and our neighborhoods and our communities and, and uh, sort of feed the collective, uh, grow the collective of uh, African people in a community or on the planet. Uh, and so hip hop, I think, says that and addresses that that's a core belief. Is that true? Is that I'm going to say yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, as my elder Mahmoud would always challenge me, uh, there's plenty of things that you could prop up to speak counter to you know us being progressive in any light, depending on who and what aspect of hip hop you're going to go after. So I always like to make a clear delineation between people who are purveyors of the actual culture and respect it, and you will find them in all different walks of life, versus people who come at it because it's a vehicle to make money, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, a distinct difference between... And so here's my question. Should you be coming at it to make money, or do you mean somebody else coming at your culture to make money for them and not you? I what, think, what are you saying? I say the practitioners should be make the ones to make money. One thing that artists are notoriously horrible at usually is commodifying their, their talent right. for their benefit. Yeah, right. Because there's that human element and you feel like as long as you give, you will receive and to a degree it's true. Mm -hmm. But there are those who will pounce on the, the, the art form in order to exploit it. And I think we, all, by all means, should control the business of So, so gentlemen, art. how do we become sophisticated businessmen and businesswomen and monetize uh, our genius in ways that uh, are consistent with our values, right? Are consistent yeah. with decency and the humanity that we say we represent, and consistent with uh, acknowledging the purpose of the gift. If the Creator gave you the gift, uh, one of those Bible stories are uh, talks about getting the gift and somebody uh, hoarding the gift and burying it, Very, somebody yeah. investing, right, and growing that gift and returning it to the Creator. Uh, Takuma, what do we do? Well, you know, I mean. Uh, First, you need to know what the seed is, what the what the what the, the plant is, you know, and then and and learn from your elders and learn from different people, you know, how they've planted before there was the supermarket, mm -hmm. you know, there was the farmers market, mm -hmm. or there was take the wagon on the road that everybody went through and you stop there and then you got people new to come there at that time. Mm -hmm. We have relied on other people's markets. Mm. We have relied on markets that they waste. Mm. You, know, uh, you know, my dad was a garbage man. He was infuriated when Kellogg's decided that they wanted to get another product out. So they told the grocery stores, if you get rid of what you have, we'll get you something else. So he had to go and supposedly bury the cereal in full boxes. Mm -hmm. not, not nothing wrong with it. So he just called somebody else to pick those up when he took picked them up from there and he took them to the dumpster, except for he took somebody else picked them up and took them to people that needed cereal. Mm -hmm. You know, and he was saying that doesn't make any sense. So a lot of times, even with with my, my thing, I knew I couldn't sell a twenty five dollar painting to somebody that, you know, used that twenty five dollars to pay for part of their rent or something. But maybe I could do something 
or find some way to do something that would represent them and make them feel better or they knew it was safe to come to this neighborhood. And then later on, as they developed and I helped them develop a community, mm -hmm. they might be able to buy something. Mm -hmm. I still wasn't really into trying to make money from my work. Then I realized there was a thing called a mural. Mm -hmm. And I could do one painting and several million people would see it mm -hmm. for free. One person paid for it. Mm -hmm. So I would find a person that could afford it. It could be a store owner, it could be a preacher, it could be a doctor. Mm -hmm. They would pay for it, and then everybody else would get to see it, it, and it would make the neighborhood and the yeah. community feel better. You know, and then somebody said, you got one of those, up at, like, you know, a little smaller? I'm like, a little smaller than that? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> you know? I can do it. And, yeah. then, and then, you know, <laughs> we'll bring it to the church, we bring it down to the basement. I do, you come to church, right, number one, and then we'll take it down to the basement in the parlor, and then you eat, and then you go out to the parking lot, and you can set up your stuff in Whatever way they wanted to do it, I did it. And all of a sudden, I had like seventeen dollars, and that was like seventeen dollars more than I had, <laughs> you know. And I could do that and do what I, you know. And that was just for one hour when I started breaking it down. I thought, wow, you could make seventeen dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. But I had been doing artwork. My father challenged me not to do artwork. He thought I was going to be broke, so he made me do a show in the basement for three days, mm -hmm. two hours a day. And my mother had her idea of suggesting that to him, and then he invited all these people, neighbors, everything, people I had never seen, people spoke different languages. And in three days, I had made $657.36 <laughs> in 1958. Wow. So I got to keep 36 cents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't even know what paper money was anyway. And the rest of it built up for me to go to college, to do whatever I needed to do. I didn't know about all that stuff yet. But these were people I didn't know. So my respect for community was strong. Mm. So in doing this thing, we have to define what the product is. We have to, we have to be our own spin doctors. Mm -hmm. We can't just say we just put out an ad because that ad might go to nobody we know. Mm -hmm. We have to find which ads go to the people we know mm -hmm. and we want to know. Charles, final 30 seconds here. How do we monetize and make our business, make our art uh, and our health and uh, our life, our business as well. Well, I, I think that we need to start having more conversations and, and educational opportunities because until, like my product, uh, when I say I create art that represents a hundred years from now, we all gone. I mean, I'm my art is pro-black. You know, father and son, mother and son, grandmothers, and so I think that we, as as a, a community, have to start to support the creative people and the people that create product in our community and make it important and significant to us. Uh, I find myself stuck in creating product when I think about the monetary uh, need that I have to continue to be able to create. Mm -hmm. You know, our uh, creative people, creative time takes a lot of time and so it's um, volunteer work until you can get paid for it. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the, we need to encourage people to see it, the value of it, not you know, it's like I don't brag that I'm a great artist. I receive that from mm -hmm. the community. Mm -hmm. And so that right there, I think, needs to translate into the community understanding that unless we support mm -hmm. this great artist or this great musician or this great uh, planner or whatever the product is, uh, we, we lose it. You know, that's the thing about we create, and we need to get those marketing talents you know, to help energy. and collaborate yeah. to create together, you know, to sell. Yeah. Gentlemen, uh, we're out of time. <laughs> this has been a good conversation, but I promise you, uh, if you promise me, this will be only the first in a series. I think this is a great and important conversation. It's one that we want to keep alive and we want to have uh, fruit uh, come from this conversation. I'm Al McFarland. My special thanks to my guest, Nick Muhammad uh, from uh, Torchlight U.S. Uh, and uh, from Titan Administration uh, Records. He's an artist and an activist. Uh, my guest, Tyrone Takumba Aiken. Takumba Aiken, a uh, great artist, muralist, uh, elder, uh, and leading light in the community and in the world. And my friend, uh, Charles Caldwell, at Charles Caldwell Studio in North Minneapolis. Great artist, a great uh, contributor to our community and to our families. Thank you all so very much. Thank you. Join us uh, next time for Conversations with Al McFarland. Thanks for having us. Yes. Yeah. Thank all you, right. man. Good, good. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Cool, cool. So, so. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We got to say good night. We want to thank Al McFarland for 
bringing us all those great words and all our lovely guests, all the guests in the house. Everything's good, you know. So I want y'all to tune in every Tuesday morning right around 9 o'clock. Because we're going to play your song. All the guests will be home. We'll be feeling like talking. Have a robust conversation. Cause this thing is safe. The message is clear. Everybody knows we gotta keep it right clear. 